I was born in Denver, Colorado, in a little city called Golden. Um, it's just like on the west side of Denver. I was only there until I was like, I think seven. And then uh, I moved to Tulsa and I went to a little school called Bixby, which is now a huge school. Um, and then I moved to Oklahoma City to go to college. How was, how was family life for you growing up? Were you in a good structured environment? Was it? Yeah, I mean, I come from two really amazing parents. Um, my dad's a preacher and my mom kind of teaches and um, they both, you know, musically inclined. My dad played the sax and the guitar and so they'd sing in church and things like that. Um, but really just being around my dad and, and him being a good dude while also, you know, you kind of have to live up to a higher standard when you're a preacher, you gotta always be on point. And I didn't really ever see a time when uh, he wasn't. And so, you know, they were really great parents. I think that um, there's some stuff growing up as a preacher's kid that's, that's tough. And there was times I definitely didn't enjoy it. Um, but in my later life, you know, now I, I definitely, those are they're some of my best friends are really wonderful people. Um, so I had two sisters. It was very structured, very, very Christian upbringing. And I appreciate that. But there's still some stuff that, that looking back, it was like having like 500 parents, you know, at the church and your actions reflect upon your parents, which could cause some resentment. And, um, you know, you couldn't really discuss couldn't really discuss what you wanted, you know, like a, a, if you were going through something and it was like morally wrong, kind of had to keep it to yourself. And since I was the the wild child of the of the three, you know, I kind of had to keep some things at bay that I was feeling and some depression that just comes with living a little bit more uh, freely, I think. And I would try, you know, I would try to have those moments and, you know, I just don't really see it. You see him, you know, it's not, you can't see faith, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And that's a hard concept to understand. And so I think it builds a little bit of an interesting dependency on on that, you know, and, and it's like, well, this is the, the key to happiness. It's, it's, and it's like, well, in life right now or today in this moment, it's not working. And and that's a lot to just try to go through when you're young, you know, when you're young and trying to make sense of everything. You really need stuff that's that's tangible. So when I was going through like a depression over a girl in high school. I couldn't really talk about it because the details of it w were, you know, something my mom would be heartbroken about. So it's interesting. And, and, and I didn't really consider it until later in life, maybe just some of those effects. Honestly, obviously growing up, my dad was a, was a major influence. He was a great athlete. He's hilarious. I mean, he's, he's, he's a quality dude. And so he's definitely one of my heroes. But I mean, my friend Blev, Blev is a producer from here and he's produced pretty much all my music before I started producing. He still produces some of my stuff. He's just... He's the most talented dude I know, but he also was like, he just was also one of the best people I know. I mean, I'm really fortunate to call my best friend him. And so I would say he's probably been one of the biggest influences on my life. I've told him that before. He's one of my heroes. And so it's interesting to have a friend like that, but probably my dad. And then uh, my uncle had MS and he was in a wheelchair. So seeing him always be happy was pretty pretty mesmerizing, you know? Um, and then my sister also, both of my sisters, but my, my, my oldest sister, she, she's the one who got MS because uh, it's kind of like a generational thing. And she just handled it so well. So I think the influences when you're younger are more external, like driven, like maybe not in your family and stuff, but as you get older, like, it really is the people just closest to you that kind of influence you. Did you play sports? Yes, I am nasty at golf, and I was I was a pretty ni pretty nice little basketball player, and that's kind of where I got into music. Is I was able to travel very early on and play like AAU basketball, and you know 
that's where I, where I really got my dose of like great hip hop. I had a coach who was just a hip hop head and he would just, we'd get in the van and he would just play stuff. And I'm like, coach, what's this? Yeah, basketball is was probably my first love, but, but golf will be my forever love. And that's funny, I, two years ago, I was, uh, I didn't know what I wanted to do next, you know? I was like, let's just see where, where this golf goes, you know? Like, uh, let's just start playing again and let's get into some tournaments and and then I ended up, you know, uh, getting a little one day gig at a golf course so I could play for free every day. And then ended up winning a couple tournaments, and just, you know, that summer and, and was kind of on a roll where I was like, man, maybe I can make a little money doing this as well and just travel and play tournaments and, and, and make music. And that was kind of my trajectory where I was headed. And, and then uh, I started the label and everything changed after that. There was a teacher named Miss Brown, and she was a biology teacher, and she was just, she was just like one of, the, I, she probably doesn't even know this story. If Miss Brown, if you see this, how are you, dear? Like, you were awesome. But uh, when I was a sophomore, I was like really, really going through just some bad, bad times, making bad decisions, and she was like the only teacher or person that was like there for me in a way that was outside of school and my family and everything you know what I mean she like tried to she like really tried to help me and, and looking back I always really appreciated uh her as a teacher yeah I have not thought back on that in years wow Kobe Bryant I was a I mean I was a I, I saw him come in the league as you know he was 17 I was like Dude, that's so cool. Like, that's so and so's age. You know what I mean? And and uh, just something about him was very like. It just was a, I don't know. It was just a fro. I just loved all of it. Like, I loved everything about young Kobe. And then you know he turned out to be such a great player. But that was like all I cared about was basketball. And so for me, it was just like Kobe Bryant, Mama mentality. I was a gym rat and. You know, I always, I read a book, and it's just like, you, got, you have to be obsessed with what you do. You have to be obsessed with what you do. I think I learned, like, I can sit here for seven, eight, nine, ten hours some days and just lock in. Um, and I used to do that same thing outside on my hoop, you know what I mean? And so, I think basketball just gave me my, my, my competitiveness, and, and it has got me a lot of wins because, I, you know, I, I like to be good at what I'm doing. I like to, like, I want to figure out if I'm going to choose to do something, I want to try to do it well. I think that going by my full legal name back in the day was just the first, I didn't know what I was doing for years, you know what I mean? I, I really didn't. I just enjoyed rapping and it was very much just some hobby based. Hey, I've always done this since I was like 13. Um, now the, now there's YouTube, now there's all this stuff, let's just put some stuff on there, I'm just, you know, young and having fun, and kind of got sucked into it, um, there's just not an outlet outside of what I'm doing that could, I guess, help in the way it has, as hard as it's been in the nose, and like, never feeling maybe that I reached where I wanted to go, um, as hard as that can be to deal with, you know, running into a, a buddy that, you know, has known my music for eight years and he's like, man, this new stuff is the best stuff you've ever had, you know, and a decade later for someone to tell you that is, uh, is a good feeling. My favorite artists of all time, the guys who I have gravitated the most when I was in, now an adult and, or in my, you know, in my college years are, are people who, you know, Frank Ocean, um, J. Cole, Kendrick Lamar, it feels like it's just about the music and it's just about that that person who made it, you know, it, it's 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 not as tied to them and you know, it, there's so much you have to do now to get recognized and TikTok becoming a thing is just the weirdest shit ever. But, you know, I get it and uh, you have to do it, but it would, it's, it's nice to just like, hey man, let's just put out music. One of my friends, Khan, He's just an indie artist, he's huge, he's underground, and he just 
he puts out like four albums a year, sits at home with, with his girlfriend, hangs out, you know, he's got a great, easy life. And, um, you know, those guys are kind of the blueprint for me as far as, like, I just can't see myself being some personality and over the top gesture. And I, I don't even know what I would go by if I came up with a moniker and things like that. It's just, it just was not me. I just felt, especially in hip hop, you know, I mean, you have to be self-aware and you have to, you know, pay respect and, and, and know that you're, you're a part of a culture, not the culture, you know I mean? And so when I came in and was like, I don't want to be anything that I'm not. I just enjoy hip hop, rapping, making music. I, that's just something that I love. It's, it, you know, it comes from just how I grew up and, and finding the right music. And, and so for me, it's, it was just like the way, the way, the most respectful way of going about this is, is just be yourself. I'm, I'm a little nuts. Just to, I mean, I'm a hair nuts, and I think you gotta be a hair nuts to, to continue to be an independent musician for a decade. I mean, you got you gotta have a little bit of, of, of chaos in your head. I don't know, man. It was just like being in college, except I just lived in a bigger city, and it was just like, okay, these are the classes. I have to go to this waiting job. This is, that's Kevin Durant. So let's try to work with him. He likes music, you know, how, how, if we're in Oklahoma City and everyone's one step away, you know, there's a connection there. We can find it. It was like, invite them to the Dom Kennedy show. They're there, you know what I mean? And, and that's it. That was the connection we needed where Kevin Durant was about our age, um, loved hip hop music, saw the shows we were throwing, thought that shit was crazy. Um, you know, we, we got, we got with Privilege, who was James Harden's artist and and so it just it just kind of worked because of like you said right then at the moment we had all the pulse we were throwing all the shows so it was just kind of that's what was going to happen and, and something that I do well and, and has helped in my career is I, I do know how to capitalize in a room you know I I know how to capitalize in a room I know okay this is this beats on let's rap I've always been able to know, like, okay, look, this is a moment here that that people will look at as a cosign, and in, in Oklahoma, people really care about that. Like outside the the Oklahoma border, cosigns, especially coast driven or professional sports driven, or you know, major networks. You know, the Oklahoma City media played a huge role in in the help, helping traject my career. I mean, they really did. And I didn't know that at the time, you know what I mean? I, I didn't know how much it was helping, but there's like a few guys that, that have just helped a lot of musicians, but I, have, I don't even know if I've told them this personally, but you know, one of the main ones is like George Lang, Brandy McDonald, just some, some talented writers here who have really helped me out and so while we had all this stuff going on it was covered you know what I mean so it really did look like this crazy movement me like I've had it up and down where at one point could bring 500 people to a show no problem making a lot of money off shows the city kind of goes through a weird this re this build of what you know a hundred new bars to go to uh, I mean, good places, and um, it just kind of, it made it harder to get people to want to come through, pay 10 bucks for a show. Um, and then Spotify comes around and kind of saves the day, and I, I did things right. But, you know, there's been times where it's like, damn, the numbers aren't what they used to be, or, or things like that. And like you said, you just have to separate yourself from it to keep going. And I think that, for me, like, uh, learning to produce gave me so much more longevity having guys be like yo man i gotta get a beat it was just like damn that's crazy you know i remember when we beat man i remember when you didn't like me i remember when this happened and, um i removed myself from the scene for a long time because of that kind of stuff you know of of just 
people crossing me that I had, I didn't even know them. You know, I didn't even, these people were not necessarily just buying into the music. They were buying into the experience, the shows, the, the, the movement, you know what I mean? The, the, the belief. It's also Obama, my home, away from home, the place I've always loved. I seriously love this place, I love the people around me. The, the, the thing that grows musicians the quickest is not all the musicians coming together. It's not the scene coming together necessarily. It's the people who believe in the scene really coming around an idea, you know what I mean? And so we had hundreds of people who believed in what we were doing to a level where they would hang posters, where they would rock the shirts, where they would buy the CDs, where they would tell their friends. And so those people all became friends. And those people, a lot of those people are still friends through that moment, those early days of those shows and meeting. That built like the foundations of a lot of people's friendships in Oklahoma City who went on to do cool shit because that's what they were trying to do when they were 22 years old. And I think that that's why you see the boom in Oklahoma City. Like a lot of these, a lot of these guys from bands and stuff or, or things like that are now like bar owners. Um, it was just, the, I don't know what you call it, the progressive time in Oklahoma City where, you know, you had a bunch of guys who were like, right at that age where where we're, we're we're itching for something other than what's going on you know here and instead of like moving we just everyone just wanted to create it i have such an attachment to oklahoma because of all of this you know because of all of those times so it's like i kind of lost hope in it for a while not oklahoma but like pushing it here doing shows and stuff like that because it became defeating but I think nowadays you can be much more independent, which also just creates a lack of like interaction amongst the scene. But really, man, I'm telling you, the, the, the increase of entertainment and things to do in Oklahoma City really was tough on local music. Hey, you guys. Sh I don't know. I just I'm just grown so much as an artist and I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing where that goes you know I, I've worked on this last album for five years I'm just so ready to get it out five years I think that I'll probably still be making music in a bigger house on some land um, and in 10 years hopefully I got a successful label with you know 50 to 100 artists who are getting to experience what it's like to be a full-time musician and full-time artist, I, I think that'd be really cool. Yeah, just the mental side of making music as an independent, you know, I, I talked to my my mom about this and she said, you know, you, you just kind of have had a, there's not a, a solid foundation to, to what I do. You know what I mean? As far as like, there's no just going to work and, hey, I got this salary, we go to work and then after, I, you know what I mean? There's just not a lot of structure and, and so for me, the things that I'm working on is, is trying to create that for myself, is, is trying to create some structure and trying to create some, some stuff that I can move forward. That's why I started the label. It was like, okay, you know, you can make music till you're 50 and that's all well and good, but you know, what, what can you do to not only help out the other musicians and, and, but be a part of music for the rest of your life and, and make money, you know? How can you provide for yourself uh, by doing what you love? And how can you con continue to do that? I'm such a future thinker. Like I, I'm so worried about, okay, where is this going though? What's gonna happen? And my weakness is not being present. And I, I lost that a while ago. <laughs> um, that's something I'm trying to work on. Something that's important to me is because I, I, I know people who are, I know people who live in the moment and I'm so, jealous of them I'm just so jealous of them and usually they have a much more simpler way of going about things you know they found a job they like and you know maybe the stability helps live in the present um, I don't know those are some of the things that I deal with day to day though for sure that I, I would consider weaknesses what would you be doing right now if it wasn't for music? I'd be a lot richer I'll tell you that <laughs> uh, I would probably just be 
head pro at a golf course, honestly. Something else, something like that. Something that has to do with golf. Maybe traveling, selling clubs. Um, I could have just sold insurance or something like that. I'd probably be like, I'm a romantic, so I probably would have been, probably had some kids and a wife. Um, music's made that hard, so. I have the album coming out. I have a song with my friend Khan. That's kind of just like the quick stuff that's coming. And then the album will drop. I'll drop a couple videos. Um, play Norman Music Fest. It's awesome. Uh, and then, man, once the album comes out, I haven't decided, but I, I might just, I might just cop me a Winnebago or something like that, and and just travel, travel around, and and you know see sights and basically consider it a big vacation. But I'd like to, you know, I got fans in Portland. I've never met them, you know, but it'd be cool to. Go to Yellowstone, go here, go to Vegas, and go to here, go, then end up in Portland. And in each way, just, hey, I'm on my journey here, you know, document it, and sell albums. But I would like to just, hey, I like this city, I'm going to spend a few days here with you guys, or what are you guys doing, you know what I mean? And we're trying to set up an actual tour in the fall. Um, and then the artist that I signed to my label has an album coming out that I produced all of it. And so, yeah, I just... It's going to be an onslaught of music for a couple years, a couple years for sure. It's like being stuck in, it's, it's, it's the scenario of why I almost quit, which would be my death in a way. So the whole time I was in kind of purgatory and when I, I didn't realize it, but I was like, came up with an album name. I was staring at the pink clouds out of, um, in Oklahoma, the fabulous sunset. I'm looking at it, I'm like, man, I'm so stuck right now. I'm just so stuck. And like, you know, like the clouds look like flamingos. I'm like, flamingo, you know, start thinking about, I'm just in limbo here and that's when it hit me. I'm like, this album's gonna be about this, where purgatory, you know, artist purgatory. Do you want to end it? Do you want to go back, reflect on everything? You need to look at the good, the bad. Uh, and really compare them and really look at yourself and really see if, if this is good, even good for your mental health or, you know what I mean? And so it, it's almost was it's like a judgment day. And so I, once I got past that and was like, no, this is what you're doing for the rest of your life, that's when I finished the album. Uh, and so it's just about that kind of moment. And things like Hollywood were very much a part of that, you know what I mean? And each record I want, not just to tell the story or try to like overdo it so they got to follow it. I just want them to feel like, okay, so early on, this was just such a good feeling, flowing thing. They were making money, they were having fun, they were partying and um, kind of as it progresses, it's like, oh, now now here's this angst and, and oh, now here's this loneliness that comes with it. And so each record I can kind of, if someone was like, well, what is this? What is this? It, what feeling does this mean? I can kind of tell them like, well, this was in this time when I was, was thinking of, of this moment. And so when I was making songs, there's so many songs for the album because it's kind of hard to do that. It's kind of hard to pick like, oh, this, this feels like this moment. Um, and so I'm excited, man. It's, it's, it's just the best music I've ever made. I'm proud to show people it. So. At Josh Lee everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. Album on the way. Flamingo on the way. Flamingo. Check it out. Sweat at your Never do trip. You know that you're pure with no flaws. I swear that you're cold.